Well, take your Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter 1, and we will look at the second part of this section that we began last week here in Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 79. And I said it before, and and I really mean it, I'll say it again, it is an incredible blessing to be able to gather with our church family this morning, this Lord's Day, that so happens to coincide with our celebration of Christmas on our calendars. And to gather to sing, to gather to sing last night and this morning about what God has done. If you think about it and you're paying attention to all the songs that we're singing, that's really the theme that carries across. What it is that God has done in bringing about salvation through His Son. And as a result of that, it's really brothers and sisters in Christ who are brought into this family of God by the transforming power of God that's singing of His redemption that we've sung about this morning and last night. Think about the words that have been on our lips as a congregation. The Son of God, in kindness He came. As a friend to the hopeless, the lost, and the lame. Our sins He bore, yet His name we despised. And the hands that brought healing were pierced as He died. It's saints that have gathered. It's saints that have been washed by the blood of the Lamb that that are singing of His promises that He's kept in the coming of Christ. What we sang a moment ago, away in a manger, a lion is born. The darkness will tremble at His mighty roar. His mercy will triumph, then death, death will be slain. The risen Lord Jesus forever will reign. It's the voice then of servants that we looked at last week, that He freed you from your sin in order to be able to serve Him without fear and holiness and righteousness, that can come to sing to their King that they serve, Hail, hail, the Word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. This is what's brought us here this morning. This morning where there's a thousand other things that really could have kept you away. That as we consider what the Lord has done for us and what He's done for others as we look around the room and see how He's been so kind and merciful and gracious to save, that we all come together this morning to worship Him who is most worthy. Because yes, it's Christmas morning, but even before that, it's Sunday morning. This is the Lord's day, and we're here to praise Him, to worship our Lord Jesus Christ, who we've looked at over the last few weeks, that departed the glories of heaven to come and to save us, leaving, leaving the glory of His Father's side to come to the side of a lowly father and mother there in Bethlehem. And this is reason to praise. And as we do praise, we do the very thing we talked about a moment ago. We join the saints of old who rejoiced at our Lord's coming. And we even join those saints that you find there in Luke's gospel. In the opening chapters of Luke, the gospel writer is intentional to record songs. Have you thought about that? In those opening two chapters, there's song after song after song that come to our attention. He records these times of praising God, and it all comes under the same theme of what God is doing in salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, so that the person who's singing is glorifying God because of all these things. In Luke chapter 1, verse 46 is where you get Mary's song, where she's praising God for what He's done through the child that she is carrying, that she has an understanding because of Scripture of the great things that have come. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14 The angels are responding to the birth of Christ, praising God with those words you're familiar with. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom He is well pleased. And then Simeon that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, there in Luke chapter 2, praising God, recognizing that the child that he's holding in his hand is the very child that will bring about salvation as God had told him he would before Simeon died, that he would see this child. And then, of course, you have Zechariah's song of redeeming grace that you find there in verse 67 through 79 of chapter 1 that we looked at last week, where Luke is giving us a righteous man singing, a man who was silent for months because he didn't believe what the angel said, is now have had his tongue loosened, and the first words you'll remember that are falling from his lips are those words, blessed be the God of Israel, not Cursed be the God of Israel because you made it where I couldn't speak. But through all that time, he grew in his faith and something changed within him. And there at that moment, he's able to speak. He's not cursing God, but he's blessing God because he knows what God has done. He's praising God when we looked at this for sovereignty and salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. That the Lord is the controlling authority that possesses and exercises 
All power brings about redemption for his people through this son according to his will. And not only does Zechariah come along and sound like, I think he's going to do this thing, but Zechariah is talking like, it's already done because the son is here in the Mary's womb. This had come to pass, and this is all on glorious display here as soon as the virgin is with child. His singing then, I think, as we looked at last week, is really for our benefit because what does it do? It leads us to worship. It leads us to worship here. Here's a worship leader in Scripture singing to God. And it causes us to exalt Christ as we see what He's done through Him. And it matures our faith. And I think it does something else that we see here, that He really provides for us an example to follow of a godly man praising God and testifying as a gospel witness as to this salvation. The sounds of the gospel and the centrality of Jesus and salvation are found in Zechariah's song. So look with me at verse 67 and hear once again his song of redeeming grace. Verse 67, Luke writes, And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace." So there are three themes that are really running through his song here of God's sovereignty and salvation through Christ's coming. One, he is singing about who God is. Two, he's singing about what God has done. And the third theme that you see is that all of this centers on the person of Jesus Christ. So as he's praising God, this is a theologically rich song. It's a doctrinally rich song, and it's describing eternal consequences. Last week we looked at those three themes, and and I'll just run through these quickly that we looked at because I I want them to be in front of you once again this morning because I think it's informative for how we praise God for what He has done in Christ's coming. This is reason that Zechariah is praising the Lord. This is a demonstration of him growing in faith because he's telling us what the Lord has done. And you remember the first thing that he says that he has done in verse 68 is that he has come, that the Christ child is in the virgin's womb, this means that salvation has truly come into creation. And as a result of that, God visiting us means that what we saw was God is gracious. That within the Old Testament, you see God visiting these people means one of two things. Either he's enacting judgment on them or he's acting in grace. And this is a demonstration of God's grace like you see in Ruth 1, 6 and 1 Samuel 2, 21. The second thing that we saw that he's describing that the Lord has done is that he's accomplished redemption in verse 68. That Christ being here in creation, he is the perfect sacrifice whose blood genuinely redeems completely. That's Hebrews 9, 11. And as a result of that, we saw something about the character of God, that God is loving. What does it mean that God is loving? It means that he's giving of himself to others in a selfless sort of sacrificial way. This is a demonstration of God's love. The third thing was that the Lord has kept His promise to David, and that's in verse 69, that Jesus is the long-awaited son of David. He is David's son, and yet He's David's Lord, and He is the one who is the fulfillment of all the promises of an old, in the Old Testament of a Savior and a King that you see in 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 17. What does that tell us about God? Well, not only do we see God is gracious and loving, but we find out here God is faithful, that He keeps all of His promises. The fourth thing that He tells us that the Lord has done is that He's acted in accord with the prophets, and you see that in verse 70, that the arrival of Jesus' kingdom signals the end of the enemies of the Lord's people. What does that tell us about God? Well, it tells us He's authoritative, 
He's authoritative, ruling and reigning over the kingdoms of the physical and spiritual realm. And we got a taste of what he's able to do where we see how he interacts with demons when Jesus is on the earth, that he casts them out of people, that they no longer reign and rule in a man's heart. The fifth thing that we saw that Zechariah is praising God about was that he's shown mercy in verse 72. And the birth of Christ is a demonstration of the mercy of God where he's showing compassion and he's showing affection upon his people. Like you see him again doing in the Old Testament in Exodus 3 where he remembers his people who are in bondage in Egypt. This again is a demonstration of who God is, that he is merciful sending his son to save. The sixth thing that we looked at last week was that the Lord had remembered his covenant, that Christ's coming is the blessing to the nations promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And again, that reminded us that God is faithful, that He keeps His word, His promises, His covenant. And the final thing that we looked at last week, number seven, was that the Lord has rescued a people to serve Him in verse 74. That Jesus is the Savior whose all-sufficient death not only saves you from the wrath to come, but genuinely frees you to do what you were made to do, to glorify God, to enjoy Him forever as a servant that you even saw that there at the end of the book of Revelation in eternity, in the future, in heaven, where you will be a servant of this king. What does that tell us? Well, not only is God faithful and loving and merciful, but God is powerful to be able to transform sinners into servants that are holy and righteous who can draw near to Him without fear. So Zechariah's song here of redeeming grace, it shows us how God has revealed His character, and He's showing us how He's mightily saved through Christ's coming, and He's announcing that God is gracious in His coming, He's merciful in His saving, He's powerful in His transforming sinners, He's authoritative over the enemy, He's loving in His giving of Himself, and He's faithful in remembering and keeping His promises. Zechariah knows God has revealed Himself in His Word this way. He has a high view of God, and when he sees what he's doing in regards to salvation through his Son, Jesus Christ, he's praising God because of who he is. In the birth of Christ, you behold the character of God here. This is Zechariah's song, and it conveys the majesty of God and the magnitude of what he's done through the birth of Christ. Now, he gives you two final reasons as to why the Lord is worthy of praise. And and these are worth our attention this morning, this Christmas morning. And these are found in verse 76 through 79 here. And again, they not only lead us to the same end, to praise God, to mature in faith, but also to follow His example that you see of Zechariah really proclaiming the gospel of truth. The eighth reason is really what you may have thought the first reason is that he would be giving here. The eighth thing that the Lord has done is that He's given His prophet. The Lord has given His prophet in verse 67. So finally, Zechariah's praise gets to the point that it has to do with Zechariah's son, John. And yet, when you look at the context of what he's saying here, he's not even the primary factor. This is all in relation to Christ. Look at verse 67. He's talking about John. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare His ways, to give His people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. He he is praising God because through this son, John, the Lord has sent the long-awaited prophet. How did he know that? Well, I think it goes back to Gabriel in chapter 1, verse 17 where the angel speaking to him and he says, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now Zechariah believes what Gabriel had to say. At first he didn't and that led to his tongue being bound where he couldn't say anything. Now he believes what Gabriel said about this son. Look at those words in the spirit and power of Elijah. You know who Elijah is from the Old Testament. Elijah was the person, the prophet that was standing boldly and prophesying before Ahab in 1 Kings 17. And he was the prophet who raised the widow's son from the dead in 1 Kings 17. He is the prophet who did not die, but maybe ended his life the way we would all like our lives to end, where we're just sort of carried up into heaven in a chariot of fire, right? That'd be fine with me. Elijah, then, note here, is who the angel compared John to. This is how Zechariah is describing his son in this song of praise. 
And he's saying this is a reason to praise God. Why? Because there were centuries of silence between the Old Testament and Zechariah walking into the temple, but things have now changed. And in those centuries of silence that we looked at last week, and you'll remember that last Old Testament book, Malachi? Oh, by the way, the final two words of Malachi read this. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. That's the very scripture the angel was citing. And here he is, a prophet who is like Elijah from of old, having returned in this sort of a way. This is Zechariah's son. He's a prophet, which means he's a servant. He's a servant of God. He's a servant of the king. And Zechariah knows it. And he's praising God for it right here. And he does it in three ways in this section. His position, his ministry, and his message. All of which, when he's describing a son, are related to the son of God coming. Look at John's position, what he says. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. John's going to be a servant of another. He's going to be a herald of a king. Even in his birth, it comes before Christ, and even his birth is pointing to another, Christ, establishing the way for Christ. So he's revealing, in a sense, the Lord's Messiah. This is his work, his ministry, his role, his position. His ministry then is laid out next, where, John, where Zechariah says, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways. Zechariah is citing there Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Malachi 3, verse 1, and Malachi 4, verse 5. And guess what? When John arrives on the scene, and John's fulfilling his ministry, he understands this. Do you remember that account where the priests were sent out to him to go, what are you doing out here where you're dunking all these people underwater, and why are they coming out to you? They're trying to figure out who he is and what's going on, and they ask him that question, who are you? And what does he say to them in John 1, He says, I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. He knew exactly what his ministry was. He knew how he was serving another. That's his ministry, his message. Zechariah understands the son's message. John's message is this, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. What does John say to the crowds who are coming out to him to be baptized? It's really good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to our affirming community. Maybe we'll make you comfortable this morning. We'll just cancel our Christmas Eve service so you can stay at home. No, he doesn't say that. He's not, he's not that kind of a guy. He's not pragmatic in any way. What does he say? When they come out to him, he goes, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He's not holding anything back. He's telling them, you need forgiveness. You need salvation. You're a sinner in need of forgiveness from God. His message was, you are all sinners. You must repent. You must seek forgiveness from God. He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's Luke 3, 3. And he's there at the right time when Jesus shows up. He's there as the guy in John's gospel who says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here he is. Here's who I've prepared the way for. Isn't that fascinating? His dad knows all this. His dad knows his position, his ministry, and his message. And all this relates to Jesus. And all of it's in the context of the gospel that not only reveals our need for salvation, you see that here, but it shows you the one that meets that need. Again, isn't this a display of God's grace sending us a prophet who's pointing the way to Jesus, of God's mercy who's proclaiming forgiveness from sin, of God's faithfulness who's keeping his word about Elijah, about God's love who is providing salvation, about God's power who's giving a son to these two old people who are well past child rearing years. Here's Zechariah praising God. And what's surprising about all of this, I think, is that when he finally gets to the point about his son, he's not primarily talking about his son, but he's talking about the one that his son will serve, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think about something as you read all this, and you understand what Zechariah knew, and you understand that John at this point is just a baby. I wonder how many times Zechariah told John about his position, his ministry, his message, as the years went by. I wonder how many times 
John heard about the sovereignty of God and salvation through Christ that his dad is singing about right here. I can't fathom that when this ends, Zechariah just goes silent again for months or decades. Surely this is not only a Christmas story in Zechariah's house, as if there was Christmas Day in that time, that, that maybe in the summer heat, as a young John is walking with his father along a path somewhere in Palestine, that, that he heard from his dad once again, oh, how the Lord has visited his people. That, that on that, maybe that first crisp morning of fall, Zechariah is still talking to his son about the Lord showing mercy through Christ. And then when the cold winter came, maybe he recounted to his son, remember that I've told you many times before that this angel visited me and he said, your duty, your job, your role, your ministry is to prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Maybe, just fathom this, at some point where they gathered for Passover in the spring, that this young man, John, heard his father speak with certainty as to how the Lord had already accomplished redemption because he sent his son into the world. That they gather around a table at some point. They're eating and they're talking about the things that he's singing about right here. Church, the story of the Lord's coming and accomplishing salvation through sending his only begotten son who was born of a virgin. This isn't just a Christmas story. This isn't just the only time that we sit with our families and go, oh, kids, let me tell you about what God has done through the birth of Christ. That this is a work of God that needs to be familiar all throughout the year with us in our household of God's mercy, of God's grace, of God's power, of His faithfulness in sending His Son. The question is, are you going to talk about it today? I hope you do. But then are you going to talk about it tomorrow? And are you going to talk about it the day after that? Are you going to talk about it with your coworkers? Are you going to talk about it with your extended family? I, I think surely Zachariah didn't just come along and go, well, it's almost December 25th. You want me to sing the song for you again, and then we'll just get on with our life. No, he talked about these wonderful things with John. And as a godly man, this is part of his life because it had to do with his salvation. This is how he is righteous. This is how he would be made right with God. So surely he regularly told John what the Lord had done. The question is, will we do the same thing? I think he provides an example in this way. So God's sovereignty and salvation, what does it do? Number eight, it gives us, he gives us a prophet who paves the way for Christ. The last one that we'll look at here is verse 78 and 79. Number nine, the Lord has sent his son. The Lord has sent his son. Now look at the way this lays out. The reason for John's message of salvation that we just looked at in verse 78 comes to this sort of a climax here in this song. The reason is this. Because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is the very thing that we're here for this morning, is it not? What is he describing? Salvation through Jesus coming. He's describing here the gift of redeeming grace. This is like a book in on what he started last week for his reasons for praising God. What was the first thing? Verse 68, he's visited us. He's come. Here, he's just talking about the son that he sent. In the Lord's sovereignly working salvation through sending his son, Zechariah here notes that it's praiseworthy because this is God's redeeming grace. And oh, by the way, this is his greatest gift and he recognizes this gift. He understands what God has done, so he describes it. How does he describe it? Well, the first thing he talks about it is that it's a gift of mercy, the tender mercy of God. From the mercy that God has shown the fathers, we looked at that last week from verse 72, now all the way to Zechariah and all those coming after him, it's mercy that characterizes the plan of God to save sinners through Christ. The words that he uses here I don't really like the word tender here because I don't think it captures what he's talking about. The word for tender that we have translated there is describing a mercy, a compassion that really is coming from within the depths of God. That, that literally this is from his inward parts. This is from the seed of his emotions. It is an affection that comes from his being God. This is the purest mercy. This is the deepest mercy that we can comprehend. And guess what? This is an old mercy. This is an old mercy that's found in Christ's coming. This is the same mercy that you'll remember Moses heard about when God revealed himself to him in Exodus, passing before him and proclaiming in Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, 
This is the same mercy that led David to praise God in Psalm 103 saying, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Some people translate that mercy. They're the same mercy that Micah attributed to God, causing him to marvel in Micah 7, 18, where he said, who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love and or mercy that you could say there. It's the same mercy. This is an old mercy. It's the same mercy that Paul ties to the forgiveness of sins in Ephesians 2, 4, where he says, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he's loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, has made us alive together with Christ. Your salvation, Christian, is a gift of mercy that you have this morning. Do you recognize the gift of God's mercy in Christ's coming? Mary is with child because of the mercy of God. The sacrifice has come because and been provided because of his mercy. Promises have been kept because of his mercy. Redemption accomplished is his mercy. When you talk about Christ coming today with your family, are you going to talk about his mercy in this? Are you able to do that? That that would be a good exercise for you today at the dinner table. Can I describe Christ's mercy in Christ's coming? God's salvation through the gift of Christ, this is a gift of unparalleled mercy originating from deep, deep within who God has always been. And Zechariah is praising here in response to this mercy. And when we join him singing, praising God for the gift of redeeming grace that is Christ's coming, we are responding to the mercy of God, responding to being recipients of this great gift. Christian, as you sat here this morning, the world you live in shows you very little compassion. The, the family members that you know, there's probably many of them that they may even refuse to forgive you for something from long ago. They may have forsaken you and don't even want to talk to you today. There are peers that you have that you may seek their favor and they just decline to acknowledge you. And the past year may have been harsh and brutal, but in Christ is the gift of divine mercy, the greatest and most needed mercy God has been merciful to you. You are the one that has offended him. He has shown you incomprehensible compassion. You are the beneficiary of divine mercy through faith. The second gift that he describes here is the gift of light, where he says, sunrise from on high visiting us. His mercy is tied to this, the sunrise from on high. He's already told us the Lord has visited us, has he not? Now he's bringing all of this together right here. And if God's mercy is very old, the arrival of the sunrise is an old promise. Malachi again said this, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, Malachi 4.2. Isaiah said, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Numbers is where we find that description of a star shall come forth from Jacob. It's describing here something like a beacon that's flashing from heaven. The Old Testament really left you looking and anticipating this light coming into a dark world with the dawn of redeeming grace. And when the child that's in Mary's womb grows into adulthood, you'll remember what he says in John's gospel in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Here he is. The sunrise from on high, what is this? This is the end to the darkness. The sun breaking upon the horizon, flooding the world here with light. The night is over. The long night of waiting for the dawn to break on salvation history finally ends as Christ comes into creation. And you've sung about this. You've already sung this. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. What are we singing about? The sunrise breaking on high. This is the dawn of redeeming grace. This is Christ coming. This is a gift for those who can see it. Certainly not all people embrace this very thing. They're not all rejoicing about this. John's gospel, John chapter 3, tells us that there are many people who are fleeing into darkness as a result of this. But for some, those who practice the truth, John 3, 21, they come into this light. 
In the birth of Christ is the long-anticipated sunrise from on high, the, the light of men, the light that believers are called to walk in, the light that conquers the darkness, and it's the light that gives hope, and that's what you see next, this gift of hope in verse 79. Shining upon those who sit in the darkness and the shadow of death. It shines in those in darkness. It shines on those in death's shadow. You think about that, and what he's describing is really a daunting place to be, is it not? Darkness and the shadow of death. But what? Christ's coming changes this. Zechariah is citing here what we read a minute ago from Isaiah 9 2. For a long time, sinners sat in the darkness of their sin and the threat of death looming over them. From this place, even those righteous men who trusted God were only able to see shadows of what God would do through types that were found in the New Testament of sacrifice of lamb and bulls, of sacrifice of, of food offerings, and, and all of this that was taking place in temple worship. But now he's saying here that the light has shone on sinners and saints. When Christ comes, there is hope. This is the Son of the Most High who reconciles you by His physical body through death to present you holy in God's sight without blemish and free of accusation. Colossians 1.22. The shepherd himself is coming here into the shadow of death, into the shadow of darkness, and rescuing His people who are sitting there. I think as we see that, we rejoice as Christians. If you're not a Christian, as you see what's going on with Christ coming into the world, don't flee into the darkness. Don't flee so that your sins won't be exposed. Come to the one who exposes them, because not only does he expose them, but he can deal with them. Christ's birth is hope for sinners. The sunrise that has flooded the darkness, yes, reveals the truth of your sinful condition, but it also reveals the sufficient Savior who can deal with it. This is what God has done in salvation through His Son, and it's a sure hope for His people, and it is a reason for joy, and this is what Zechariah is singing about, that the Lord sending His Son is a gift of mercy, light, hope, and finally peace. He says here of Him, guiding our feet into the way of peace. Is this not what the angels were singing about that we looked at a moment ago? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom He is well pleased. That the light that came into the world by the deep mercy of God, this child guides our feet into the way of peace, the feet of those who were once an enemy of God because this is where your sins have left you, Romans 1.18, under the wrath of God. Paul concluded, you'll remember in that section there in Romans 3.11, that not only are none righteous, but in Romans 3.17, that the path of peace they have not known. That you've never really known peace. But what you find here is that peace with God comes through this child whose hands and whose feet would be pierced for the sins of his people to deal with his wrath, to offer peace. Zechariah is praising God for Jesus who guides our feet into this way of peace. The peace with God is found through Jesus Christ. So, so take the sum total of all this. The gift of His sending His Son, mercy, light, hope, and peace. All told, what is that? It's your eternal life. Your eternal life in this child. The very thing Paul talks about in Romans 6.23, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what's found in the gift of Christ. Zechariah's song here shows us that he knows what he's been given. He is a man who understands this gift of salvation by God's mighty hand, and he's praising God for it because he recognizes in this it's also a demonstration of God's great love. Jonathan Edwards said this, and I think this relates, everything that was contrived and done for redemption and salvation of believers, and every benefit that they have by it is wholly and perfectly from the free, eternal, distinguishing love and infinite grace of Christ towards them. If that's true, then so is His birth. If that's true, then in His birth is this great demonstration of God's love, a love that you can't scarce comprehend, a love that you can't compare to anything else. Look at this, Zechariah's tongue is loosened, and he can't help but tell what God has done. The question I'm asking is, what about you? What about you? 
do you speak the same way? He, he's giving us an example, I think, in some way to follow here. Is, is we put lyrics in a worship guide for all of us to sing along to, or we put worship lyrics up here on the screen for all of us to join in and sing to, we get something of the same thing here from the song leader in Scripture. To be able to join in, to be able to express, and to be able to sing what God has done. Will your tongue be loosened to tell of how the God who is sovereign over salvation saves sinners in Christ? Will you speak of these things to others? And will you do it, and, and let me encourage you this way, to do it with joy, like you see Him doing, praising God here, not to do it with drudgery, to do it with eagerness and not to do it with dread. Church, this is what the early chapters of Luke's gospel were filled with, singing, singing about the events of Christ coming, the very thing that we celebrate this morning. Whether it's Mary's song, angels glorifying God, Simeon's worship in Luke 2, Zechariah's song of redeeming grace, or all those things that we've gathered to sing about this morning, all of them are rejoicing in Christ's coming, making clear what God has done, revealing who He is, and central to it all is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As you depart here this morning, Christian, I want you to leave being very much assured that you have a reason to sing, to join with the saints of old, to sing, because you truly have something to praise God about. You've already been given the best gift. You already have what is an eternal gift, this one doesn't fade away. This is a divine gift. You can never lose this gift. It will not decay. It cannot be taken away from you. It will not lose its luster. What do you have? You've been given saving faith and eternal life. You've been shown grace from God. You've been adopted as a son or daughter into His household. You've been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. You've been given a new heart and a renewed mind. You've been freed from your slavery slavery to sin to be able to serve Christ. You've been bought with a price. You've been reconciled to God who was once your enemy. You've been sanctified through your suffering. You've been given assurance through your faithfulness in various trials, and you've been made to glorify and enjoy your God forever. You've been given something of profound value, and it all is because God has given us to this through His Son. This is the gift of redeeming grace, and may it forever be our song. Father, thank You for the truth that you've given us in your word. And thank you for that truth revealing the most profound thing that we could scarce imagine that you've given us your son. And this morning as we gather, I pray that our song would join saints of old and saints today and saints who are around the world to sing of what has taken place through Christ's coming and redemption. Lord, find us faithful as we even leave here this morning in a few moments after singing Find us faithful as we go into our homes to speak about these things, to be able to talk about what the Lord has done in sending His Son in salvation. They're laid out here before us. Let us revisit these again. Let, let them be impressed upon not only our mind but our heart. And let us come and speak about them to our children. Let them be very familiar and let them always be in awe. Let this lead to the very thing it led to in, Zach, to in Zechariah here of praising you. And let that same heart of worship be heard in us this morning, we pray. Amen.